Welcome, everybody, to the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy and America Facebook Live, Season 4, Episode 7, with our special guest host, Adriana Trigiani, what I like to now call our Audrey episode, since she's been guest host, it's become customary for every season that we've been on. Uh, before we get started on our children's book episode, which is going to be a fantastic episode, I'd like to tell everybody about the contest that the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy and America is having for all of its members. Thanks to Bianca Otone from My Italian Family, she donated a genealogy research package that's worth $3,000. And all you have to do is be a member of Order Sons and Daughters of Italy and America and send us your family photo, your old family photo. Everyone has one. In the spirit of sharing and caring, I will share my grandmother at her wedding, Clara Dicchetti. And that's, this is one of my, my family photos that I cherish. And I'm sure everybody out there has one as well. If you're not a member, you can go on osia.org, find out how you can become an at-large member or join a lodge. And if you want to know more about the family photo contest, we've been receiving some wonderful photos of how to enter. Please go on osia.org and take a look. There's a banner right on the home page about how to enter the family photo contest. So let's get started with tonight. We have, as always, out of the national office, our managing director, Justin Smith, who's been wonderful in attending each and every one of these episodes. Uh, he's a fixture at this point. Um, and then we have two fantastic children's authors. We have Diana Pishner walker who has authored a plethora of children's books. I'm holding up the fishy tail, but a plethora of children's books that are geared toward Italian American traditions. And then we also have Barbara Barcelona Smith, who has authored Let's Eat Snails. Very unique, very wonderful, very wonderful hardback, which is really nice. And um, I would like to let Audrey take it away. And at some point, Adriana is going to talk about her own children's book that's due out December 28th. There it is. There it is. Thank and um, I'd like you to take it away, Audrey, and let's talk about some children's books and what it takes to make it and where they come from. First of all, congratulations on four years, Justin and Miles, because these shows are spectacular. I love them. Uh, I um, love coming in, you know, and, and just talking with these brilliant writers. And also, you know, it's a way for us to connect about our heritage in a way that we can't do it anywhere else. So to everyone that's within the sound of my voice, you're in for a treat tonight because I love these books so much. Um, and I'm gonna tell you what they share and what these authors share is a love of their traditions and history and of their Italian roots. Who, you know, everybody you meet wants to be Italian. Well, these ladies are. So, um, and so they, and they, they, it's not that our families are all the same, but we share similar cuisine, similar uh, characters pop up in the families. And the books are very original and very interesting. And they're not your run of the mill stories that are general. They're very, there's a specificity and a particularity to the Italian experience in these books. And I recommend you get them as we're, you know, as the show is going on, you'll, you'll see as we talk to the ladies. So why don't we start, let's start with Diana. Uh, Diana, I'm so thrilled to meet you. Um, I'm so thrilled to meet you. <laughs> you're so gifted and you, you have such a love of your Italian roots. And you take uh, what I would call a traditional story style and you turn it on its ear. So, so in, in, in the immigration story that you did, and I love that you dedicated it to your kids. I bet you did rabbit stories. I, I'm sure when they were little, but there's this wonderful notion. You made it a rabbit's tale of immigration so that children could have this sense of imagination and wonder, but I'm curious because our families ate rabbit, why you chose 
the rabbit. Hello, Adriana. My, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And again, I am thrilled to death to meet you as well. Um, my story started with um, actually a memoir, a very short memoir that I wrote about the loss of both of my parents. And after their loss, we were cleaning things out. And I had a family that had a four story home full of, you know, everything, you know, we don't throw anything away. Right. And it took us a year to clean it out. Well, it, it, in cleaning things out and getting things in perspective, I came across a little short blurb about a, a rabbit named Joby that my mother wanted to write the story about. And I right. thought, okay, God, is this, okay, I'll try. <laughs> uh, so that's where the rabbits came from there. She started it and I feel like I finished it for her. And after the immigration, when um, I kind of couldn't stop and went on to the Bafana and then about the wedding. The Bafana, of course, this is the time of year. We, we right. should, everybody should have this under the tree for one of the kids in the family. It's, it's fantastic or all of them. Thank you. Um, well, could you speak to what is it about when, when our parents go, when they're no longer here, why is it we are so compelled to make sure that, that others understand? And I think this could be an Italian thing. Mm -hmm. That others well, understand who they were and why they were important. Because your mother, you're Italian on your mother's side, right? And your dad both. was... What? No, both sides. Okay, well, oh, so this is your married name. Yes. Walker is my married name. Pishner was my father's name, but at some point in time, it was Pishkinetti. So they changed it somewhere along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, Interesting. It's very... It, they're Everybody both, in the family uh, upset that the name got changed? Um, by the time it was changed and it was to our generation, nobody cared anymore. You know, it was... You just learned to live with it. But... Um, I kept a journal when my parents were sick and, and when after they passed, I kept writing and writing. It was great therapy for me. And you're asking about why we feel like we need to continue their traditions and customs to carry on. The name of the little book that I did that was the um, memoirs called I Don't Want to Sit in the Front Row Anymore. Great title. And we can get that where we can get the children's books. That's terrific. On my website. Yes. Um, this is self-published. But that was great therapy for me. And it, and it brought out, I guess, that I could write a book because I showed it to some of my coworkers and they encouraged me to write it. And I thought, no, I'll just write it, keep notes, give it to my kids. And they encouraged me to publish it. And it started selling and people started telling me how much it was helping them. Did you, um, so so it was, it was there. It's interesting to me that it was therapeutic mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. That was a spell. Okay, so the start of it, the seed of it was this idea, you're closer to your mother because your mom had this idea mm -hmm. and you were able to finish it, to complete it for her. Right. Why do you think your mother didn't complete it? Actually, I think she, she did a couple of times. Um, she wrote some things and they passed through our hands and there, she never did end up sending it away. I don't know, I guess I wanna think that she left it for me to finish. Did she tell you the story when no. you went to bed at night? No. Was she somebody who read to you at night? Yes, but not her own stories, just other stories. But she never fabricated one and, and told you? No. Now, how about your father? My father played the harmonica to us. <laughs> he didn't tell the story. Yeah. So what in the do you, do you remember a particular song he played? Yes, I do. Yeah, he always played You Are My Sunshine. So whenever I see that, I think that's my sign. But in, you hear in that the, too somewhere, that, that it, it's, it stokes your creativity. Yep, yep. Do you think you're going to see them again? Oh, yeah. You do? Yeah, I have no have, doubt. You have, you have a faith about that? I do. I'm, I'm with uh, Barbara. I'm very Catholic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, I am too. I'm you'll horrible, notice I'm a horrible sinner, but I am a Catholic and I'm proud to be Catholic. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah, well, it was, you know. In the story, like it, particularly this one, you'll see that there's someone playing a harmonica. Uh, you know, my stories are kind of. Oh, all you, you weave it in. 
and yes. weave it in. The texture of your stuff is what your parents actually imparted to you. Exactly. Can you tell us a little bit about your home growing up? Um, well, I grew up in Clarksburg, West Virginia, and uh, Italian families on both sides, lots of cousins, uh, the pasta meatballs every Sunday after mass at my grandparents' house. I have one brother, one sister. My brother um, travels, has traveled to Italy many times. He has uh, an Italian band called the Amici's. And my sister um, took on the dance part and she teaches Italian dance. She has a group called the Allegro Dancers. Fantastic. And are they in West Virginia? My brother is and my sister's in Pennsylvania. And where are you? In West Virginia. Okay, so would you would you tell everybody because you're you're like me, we we moved to Southwest Virginia, but not West Virginia, but the state of Virginia, close to Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, North Carolina. That's where Big Stone Gap is. Mm -hmm. What trade was your father doing or your grandfather doing that you? My grandparents. Up well, my grandfather's actually came here, and I was telling um, talking about this earlier, and went straight to the coal mines for jobs. That's right. Yeah. A lot of Italians in the coal mines, people don't know that. And there's a lot of beautiful Catholic communities in the mountains. Yes. Small, small mm -hmm. communities, but, but connected. Yes. And everybody knows everybody. And everybody knows everybody. So are you more Italian or are you more Appalachian? I'm more Italian. <laughs> Very much so Italian. Yeah. yeah but you know, the harmonica... The creativity, the storytelling, that's deeply Appalachian. But I would always say this when I was growing up, that, that when our relatives would come over from Italy, mm -hmm. there were similarities because we were from the mountain. This side of the family was from the mountains. And mountain people are mountain people, mm -hmm. wherever you go in the world, right? My families were from Calabria. So there were a lot of mountains there. A lot of mountains, a lot of mm -hmm. rocks. Yep. So, so the, your family almost found a place. It was. It had to do with the work, but it also had to do with the fami the familiarity of the mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they felt home mm -hmm. in West Virginia, and Absolutely. that's what they say. My uh, mother's side, there were nine brothers and sisters. Wow. My dad's side, there were only four. Um, Look, only four. That's a huge only group. four. But today, you know, that's a lot of kids today, <laughs> and I have three. It's a lot. It's a lot. I, I think that you're a beautiful storyteller, Diana. Thank you. And I know we have more than the two that I'm holding up, but I was completely enchanted by these books. I, and I love your illustrations and they're done by Ashley Teets. She's actually Belote now. She's a married woman. What's her last name now? B-E-L-O-T-E, Belote. Belote, nice, okay. So she's a, she's a young woman. She just yes. got married or okay. Yes. And no children yet. No. And she just became an author herself. Well, she's got a real understanding of the, you know, of it's, of the it's like I I think it, I picture it and she draws it. Amazing. So we're going to give her a shout out. She's award winning and a 2012 summa cum laude graduate of Alderson Broadus College, where she earned a BFA with a minor in creative writing. While well, she's like, you're you're simpatico with her clearly, because she's she she really brought your stories alive. Actually, I do honor the first children's book that I wrote is called Spaghetti and Meatballs: Growing Up Italian. Oh, nice! And when I took I took family pictures to Ashley to draw from, and she did. And she ended up making a collage of those pictures in the front of, in the back of the book. And like this one, uh, see, this is my grandpa. This looks like my grandfather. Wow. So she saw a picture mm -hmm. and then she riffed off of that. She, she improvised. Um, what, what do you love the most about writing? Sharing it, sharing my stories. I go to a lot of schools do a lot of workshops for children and adults and just sharing my story and how it came to be and um, trying to encourage the younger ones to write like Miles, wherever he is, write <laughs> um, and, and share your own story. How important is, is it to you that you're telling these Italian-American tales? 
like I tell my children and my grandchildren and even the schools that I visit, I tell the kids, well, put it this way. At the end of my session, I said, all right, here's your homework. You need to go home and ask mom and dad, grandpa, grandpa, anybody where you came from and what your background is and write it down. And when your grandma and grandpa want to tell you those stories, write them down because someday you're going to be an adult like me and you're going to have to be the one that knows all these things. That's right. Nobody above you is going to be and there to nobody, ask questions. Nobody will tell you, and nobody will know the story quite right. like your grandparents do. Right. That's also a very Italian tradition to make sure that the stories are handed down. Right. And then in this, um, this is the latest one, The Fishy Tales. And there's a movie that, <coughs> excuse me, was written, produced, and it's called uh, The Feast of the Seven Fishes by Robert Tennell. Okay, I have to tell you, I saw that movie. Okay. And Mario Cantone told me to watch it, and it was filmed in West Virginia. Yes, yes, that's, it was filmed in I my I'm going to reach out to those guys, uh, but I, I never did. But I, I thought the movie, they did a great job. Well, Robert actually put a little blurb on the back of this book for me. So right. we have uh, in Fairmont a feast coming up the second weekend in December, and it's the Feast of the Seven Fishes, and it's here in Fairmont, West Virginia. They'll show the movie. I sell my books. It's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, let us know all the details, and we'll make sure we, we all share it and post it, and you know, okay. you'll get a crowd. Okay. Maybe a crowd you don't want. It's all right. Crowd. <laughs> all right. Let's bring Barbara in. Barbara Barcelona Smith. Hello. Oh, Barbara. All right. So, Barbara, your book too, enchanting, but there's a real story here about this snail, the stew, and this recipe, and this family, and how they look forward to this. What compelled you to write it? Exactly what you were just talking about. First of all, thank you for having me on OSDIA, Miles and Justin. It, Adriana, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm thrilled. Love the books I've read. They're brilliant. Just exactly what you were talking about. Uh, compelled to share the traditions and the stories and the experiences that I had growing up. They're important. Um, Why are they important? Because you have to pass on the traditions to the next generation. I was on Tony Listella's, uh, the Italian radio show, West Coast Radio, and he had a program and it was bridging the generational gap. And we talked exactly about this. You got to share what the old timers were doing with the young, the young ones. So the nonos are talking about the lumaki with the little ones. And this, it's just a brilliant experience. We really do pick purified cook and eat snails. Uh, the way we cook it in our house is babalucci in Sicilian, Sicilian snail stew. Snails are delicious. They're good for you. They're good protein. But um, I always tell every child I encounter, never eat a raw snail. Very important. I even have a disclaimer in the book. Um, but it was a brilliant childhood. We had so much fun doing weird stuff. Uh, when I go to author visits, we're always laughing about who here, and the ethnic kids always raise their hand, who here had weird stuff in their lunchbox? And it's always the, you know, the Latinos and the, uh, uh, the super ethnic kids and the Italians. I mean, I couldn't eat cold cuts, Italian or otherwise, uh, for 25 years after I got out of elementary school. Capicola and mortadella. Oh my God. Every single day, mom, every day, you know, so this story is a reflection of my upbringing and the things that we did and things that we do today. I do this with my old dad today. And um, something so unique in the book, uh, Barbara, that I just, that I loved, which is if, if you didn't know you and you didn't know your family by the end of the book, I understood you again, as I said to Diana, there was a particularity about this story. And I thought how fabulous for kids to read this. And most kids nowadays don't even know from snails. I mean, they don't even, they don't eat them. They don't know um, unless sometimes they're in a very, very fancy restaurant, which is the opposite of this working class. I could tell they were working class from That's these right. beautiful illustrations by Karen Lewis. They're working, it's a, it's a working class family. 
Absolutely. But you never say it, Barbara. You, we just, we embrace it. We, mm -hmm. as we're reading, we see it. Yeah. Because people that eat snails, that's, they, the, that's the inventiveness of the attack. They were poor. Uh, they, they were poor. And he grew up on the hills in Sicily. And to this day, we can't go for a car drive if he doesn't see greens on the side of the road, mustard greens, whatever. He's going to stop and he's going to chop them up and we're going to go home and we're going to make a little frittata out of it. He lived off the land. We still live off the land. Um, and he's got a beautiful orchard that he grafts trees in the backyard. And this story is just a reflection of the Italian spirit, Italian resiliency. We overcome. Not only do we overcome, but we thrive and we succeed. And he's, he's a true success story uh, from nothing to something great. He's got a beautiful home on the central coast of California. He provided a great life for three kids. My sister is the director of Fiscal in California. Thank God I came first. My brother was a restaurant owner for 16 years and we just had the best childhood. And these stories are fantastic. And when I was on WJCU on Cleveland radio with Aldo Filippelli, he had his uh, old pops on with us. And he started talking about the Lumaki. And I threw some Italian words out there. I know exactly two phrases, mangiacara farana and silenzio schiofone na faccia, which means shut up, I'm gonna smack you in the face. Not the new generation of PC, but that's how we grew up. But anyway, he starts uh, going off into 100% Italian. So I have a little bit of a panic attack. My guardian angel kicks in. Thank God I kept up with everything he said. He was talking about how beautiful it was in Sicily and in Italy. They did this. They actually ate snails. They picked them. This brought him back so many decades and it was beautiful. Aldo Filippelli was like in tears because he hadn't heard these stories from his father. And that's what this book is doing. It's bridging this gap and it's bringing these stories to of old Italian tradition making it into fun modern terms we real i did this with my friends i had to bribe them to help me to get to spend the night and they had to eat and try stuff if they didn't like it they didn't have to finish it but they had to try it and um i'm thrilled to share it with kids they love it and who what kid doesn't love a story about bugs anyway <laughs> it's so true and i think in that way you're completely contemporary and modern in the way you tell a traditional story which I think parents will go crazy for. It's this notion that um, it's not typical. And yet at the same time, if you're a traditionalist, which a lot of our viewers are to this show, you're gonna, you're gonna have your own, it'll, it'll jog your own memories and it'll, it'll enhance the memories that you have of, your, of the older people in your family or even of your grandparents. That's it true. really gives you a fresh, it's, it's so freshly done, Barbara. I just thought really beautifully written. And, and you. just, you, you don't shy away from the snail of it all either. <laughs> no, I don't. Now, now I was waiting. Now I understood because the stew was different. In our tradition, my, gra my grandfather, who I never met, he died when my mother was eight years old. He made them on Christmas Eve with the garlic and the butter and the, and Delicious. And when they cook them, they put a quarter in there to wow. make sure that. Yeah. Yes, they do that with um, uh, mushrooms too. Make to sure make it's not sure, poisonous. Something. Make sure they're okay. If you, the yeah. poison ones are, or the bad ones are then weeded yeah. out. Supposedly, you, it turns the silver coin black. Now, I thought you did a great job of this in the book, but tell us what that what that stew tastes like for those of us who never had it. Okay, so. It really is stewed to your taste. So we like a little bit of spicy with a lot of flavor and a lot of peppers. And you, uh, the author video that I get to share with students, uh, it, my father's in it, my whole family's in it. And he's talking in his accent and he's clipping his rosemarina and a little bit of potatoes and a lot of peppers and a little of this, a little of that. The stew is however you like the stew. And then the snails, we, we grew up purifying it for six weeks in cornmeal, flushing them out, flushing them out, flushing them out. And then you boil them for 20 minutes and then you got to clean the green guck. Wait, wait, and slow down. Flushing them out. Explain that to everybody. Well, 
So they were, we put them in fancy schmancy buckets, <laughs> with drilled holes in the side with a mesh net over the top. And uh, they would feed on the cornmeal and they would purge. So you would clean the buckets, put the snails in a fresh bucket with the fresh cornmeal and we would purge them. So there were snails there to this day, there's snails there in his yard, backyard patio. And each snail in its progression, you know, would purge. And by the time, you know, five, six weeks, they're delicious because they taste like what you fed them, which is the cornmeal. And then you take them into the house and then you boil them for about 20 minutes. That's it. Not long. And you get all rid of all the guck. And then you put them very gently uh, into the stew. And you don't want to break those shells. Nothing's worse than having shells in your stew. So you gently put them in the stew. The stew is mostly cooked. So you cook it another 20, 30 minutes to have the flavors absorbed. And then it's delicious. It's even better the second day like all good sauces and pasta in it because it absorbs into, you know, the flavors absorb. It's delicious. We do it. And the video is our kids, my brother, my sister, and my own kids trying snails for the first time. And it's hilarious. Some liked it, some did it, but they all tried it. And that's the point of this book. It's about oh, trying things in life you're scared to try. Carrots, celery, potatoes, bell peppers, tomato sauce, garlic, it's beautiful olive oil to make all of it, you yes. know. You should have heard my parents fighting on the on the video. I had to be edited out. <laughs> garlic <laughs> first, the, the onions are first, the more garlic, the less of garlic, more onions, the more I said, I, we're not doing a recipe. I don't want to have a civil war in my house. We just <laughs> There's also something else that you did in this book that I thought was genius, which was it's really a, a love letter to slow cooking, to the slow preparation, page by page, you add details. Yes, what that is how we did it. But it's also great storytelling, Barbara. And, I, and, I, and Diana, it, it, she's got this, Diana's got this down too. Yes. And by that, I mean, you're both really gifted in the way that you take Italian traditions and make them um, write them in a way that whether you're Italian or not, you're going to embrace it. But if you do have Italian roots, and I think this is really special for people that might have it just on one side of their family, it ignites an interest in what we come from. Mm -hmm. It ignites a sense of possibility about what we come from. You, you both are very well versed in, in, in the Italian part of your lives where you come from in Italy and what life must have been like because storytelling was the entertainment. Mm -hmm. So what the natural progression of that are books. Absolutely. That's the natural progression. That's right. So, so let me ask you this question, Barbara, as I asked Diana. When you were a little girl, did anybody read to you or did they tell you stories? How did it go? Uh, dad told stories. Mom read stories. And she read, you know, Horton Hears a Who, because we're all little people, so we could all relate to a person is a person, no matter how small. So, and she empowered each and every one of us to believe and achieve and go for your dreams and each one of us really have <clears throat> my ultimate goal and dream was to become a published author and I did it and um my father was more of a storyteller and you know and he still you know he tells the stories from memory and this story and that story and a lot of uh growing up stories and Absolutely. stories from the old country and my husband's very good to listen to those stories over and over and over and over and over Again. That's what they're there for, really. What, yeah. what, what other purpose does he have? Um, I'm totally teasing you. He's, he's a <laughs> pilot. I mean, I mean, please. He's a man of great accomplishments. Um, Barbara, when, when you wrote the book, can you tell us a little bit about your process? Okay. So uh, my daughter was born. It was the first year. And I'm... A very hyperactive person. I like I'm I don't sit a whole lot. That first year was tough with the newborn and 
trying to do things the right way and all natural. And I was going crazy. I'm not going to lie. So I said, you know what? What better time than to start writing now? I don't want to look back on my life on the rocking chair and say, I never tried. I'm going to put myself out there. So I ended up writing four kids books and a screenplay directed towards Lifetime TV. Let's see if I get lucky. And um, so I utilized that time. And it's taken me, it was between uh, that first year and her turning about three that I wrote those five pieces. Then it took me all those years to get a publisher to listen, take on a nobody. That it's tough. It is tough to get published. I would not lie to one person out there. It is tough. And you have to be tenacious. Why do you think, it, why do you think it's difficult? To get published. Oh my gosh, because your script, your, your manuscript gets put into the great abyss. It gets put into a pile. And if you're not a name, it doesn't even get read. I mean, you are put in stacks like this. So how I got published is I did my research and um, this, is a, this is a God thing. Suzanne LaRosa is in my state and she's a Paisana. She's a Sicilian a uh, New Yorker who's in Montgomery, Alabama. How rare is that? Uh, very yeah. rare. Her and I are it. And let me tell you what, I broke every rule in the book. I would literally show up unannounced and just park until she talked to me. And I mean it. I, and she was so polite. She would always humor me. And that song and dance, that Tarantella went on for a few years. We signed the contract. Then, I love you, Suzanne, but I did get bumped. I got bumped for a lot of established authors. So I had to have paciencia, which I'm terrible at. It was torture. So then the book finally got published. And then um, I spend my time marketing it now and going to schools and talking to beautiful people like yourselves. And so it was tumultuous. It was difficult. I'm not going to lie. I'm not that got lucky story. I'm that came from the poor hills in Sicily, worked my rear end off have a nice house in California, three great kids, and a daughter who finally published the book because she had the same work ethic. I mean, you, you have to really believe, and you have to believe in yourself. That's it. You have to be able to, to hear people say, eh, it's not good. I don't like it. Who's going to want this? Da, da, da. You have to really believe. And I think as a writer, you know, like I've written stuff, and I'm like, that's good. And then I've written stuff, and I'm like, hmm. I know that needs a little more work. So that is my tumultuous journey, but it was right. worth every step of the way. It's a beautiful way. journey and the results are just this beautiful story. And, and obviously you've written others. So you, you, you have a canon now of work and you branched out into dramatizing, which is screenplay writing. Um, Diana, was your situation getting published difficult? <laughs> I'm the God, what did, what did you call it? The God, uh, it, no, it happened. My publisher found me. Oh um, my gosh. <laughs> I Beautiful. went looking for an illustrator for this children's book, the Spaghetti Meatballs book that I found. And when I found this illustrator, which ended up being Ashley, um, she and I went back and forth, back and forth. And finally she asked me if she could show our work to her mom. Well, just to back up a little bit, the story that I self-published, I was looking for this particular publisher to publish it. And my friends kept encouraging me to go to this, this publisher, use this publisher. And we kept missing each other, missing meetings. We'd have to cancel. So finally I said, I'm publishing this myself. Well, then to go forward a year, when I, Ashley and I were working on the Spaghetti Meatballs book, and it finally came together, and she asked me if she could show this, our work to her mom, and I said, yeah, sure, you know, she's young, she's proud of what she's drawn, and I don't mind, go ahead. Her mom was the publisher I was looking for the year before. Wow. So, <laughs> she says, my mom wants to talk to you, and I said, okay, why? She said, well, she's um, Kathy Teets and she has headline book publishing company I said are you kidding me I said I looked we tried to talk for a year she said well she likes your work she wants to have lunch and we should it the relationship started from there fantastic there's a little bit of fate involved there oh yeah somebody was helping me yeah 
with Ashley and you. There was fate that you were yeah. to meet. Now, do you feel that connection with your illustrator, Barbara? Oh my gosh, Karen is brilliant. So, because it took a few minutes to get my book published, my uh, wonderful publisher, Suzanne, she said, you pick your illustrator. And I said, a good answer, thank you, grazie. So I saw uh, her work and she did um, Arturo books and in those um, books are about Hispanic family and there's a lot of people in those books and, and they were beautiful. And my book is all about people. I mean, there's, there's the terrain and the, you know, the snails and everything else, but the gist of the book is a lot of people. So I needed somebody to make it beautiful and engaging and intriguing for a child. And um, she just, she nailed it. She's she, she brilliant. Made, she makes the garden a place that you do not want to leave. That garden is real. We really did have purple string beans. And we really did have giant California, giant zucchinis. I mean, giant, we ate zucchini muffins, zucchini bread, zucchini pancakes, zucchini pastas. Oh my God, I couldn't eat zucchini for a lot of years too. <laughs> so that so garden zucchini, is You know, real. zucchini, uh, dandelion, uh, uh, you know, the, these things that grow copiously, you know, if you're in your farm or in your yard or wherever, you know, we ate everything and we yes. appreciated it too. That's true. There was no way. I, I don't think anything tastes as good as my grandmother's dandelion salad. I, and, and no matter how fancy the place is, we go to eat. Do oh, you feel absolutely. that way about the cuisine that you had when you were growing up, Barbara? Oh my gosh. Yes. Everything we did. My mother, she was so brilliant. In the beginning, it was my mom. My mom cooked, 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 and everything was from scratch. The pasta, the bread, the Italian. Oh, Diana, the Italian breads in um, your books are so beautiful. It brought me back to my childhood because mom would put the colored Easter eggs in the middle of it and that sweet bread. It was beautiful. I was the lazy cook. I'm not going to lie. So I remember always thinking there's got to be a faster way to do this stuff. Now, my sister and her children and my brother, who owned a restaurant for 16 years, uh, they still cook everything from scratch and it's delicious. And I'm just sure that my, one of my nieces is going to be a chef one day. And uh, so we grew up, everything was from scratch. We did everything the slow way and everything was brilliant. It was beautiful. Now my dad does a lot of cook the cooking and the rabbits. It's so funny you said we ate the rabbits. We still eat the rabbits. Uh, there's not a, there's not a rabbit on our property that is safe anyway. So we, uh, you know, he does a lot of the cooking now and it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it's delish. Now, besides the snails, Barbara, what is your favorite Italian meal? Oh my gosh, my brother's carbonara. Oh my gosh, it's delicious. Tell us how he makes it. Oh my gosh, I don't know. Lots <laughs> of the cream is so perfect and the pasta is just so perfect. And he does everything and I just get the bowl and he manja and I get to do it. And I didn't have to be in the kitchen. Now, now I'm telling, telling uh, uh, some of my secrets that I'm the lazy one, but it's true. I don't really know how he, with the, of course, with a little bit of bacon in there and you know, it's, right. it's so rich. It's just so flavorful. Mm -hmm. And um, so say, spaghetti carbonara is your favorite. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Your brother, but it's your brothers who own the restaurant. Where was his restaurant and what was the name of it? Paisano's Pizza and Pasta. And it was in Grover Beach for 16 years on the central coast of California. Francesco Giuseppe Barcellona. Oh, he was, oh. it was so great. The food was fantastic. Sounds and, incredible. Yeah, it was good, good times, good food. We still eat good food. It's just not at the restaurant, so. Right, well, he makes it for you now privately. That's even better. Diana, how about you? What's your favorite meal? I'm going to have to say a tiela. Now, what is that? Do I know what a tiela is? Um, the word well, we all have different names for stuff, so. Right. The word tiela actually just means a dish, but in my family, it means the zucchini, potatoes, tomato sauce. Oh, um, yeah. Good. Meat, vegetables, everything that's left over in the fridge is baked in that tiela. And we usually only have it in the summer, but it's one of my favorites. Fantastic. 
And what's your favorite holiday memory, Diana? Uh, our Christmas is so we're coming one. into the holidays now. Yeah, our, our it, now it's Thanksgiving, but our, my Christmas uh, growing up was my favorite. I had an uncle that um, my uncle John Pinion, and he did decorated all of the um, this famous department store in our town, and he did all of the windows. And we couldn't wait till those windows were finished to go up there and see what Uncle John did this year for the Christmas windows. Describe them to us. Um, a lot of mechanical things and very, very colorful. And there was the window. I, I don't know. I'm not good with sizes, but it was two huge windows. And everyone in town, you, there were lines behind these windows just to look at what he did every year. But like what was in the wind? Like there were mechanical, but can you describe the colors? Um, and what were the characters and what were they doing? A lot of them? red, green, Santa. Depend on his theme that year. You know, he had Santas. He had elves. He had like... Um, Oh, like gingerbread houses, and and then some years he'd have an angel and a nativity scene, and it was beautiful. Was there music pipe to go with it? Mm -mm, not not back then. <laughs> no. So so people would line up to see his windows. Was that his only job, or did he work in the coal mines and he did the windows? No, that was his job. He worked in it was called Parsons Souders uh, Department Store. And later turned to Stone and Thomas department stores. And a lot of my family members worked there. But who owned that department store? I don't remember. Um, the actual so your whole member. family worked for this, whoever this person was, right? Yeah, but it was it and it ended up being a chain. It turned into a chain store. Right. But did they ever own a store? Not as well, they owned. Uh, I had another uncle that owned a pizza shop, like she was talking about. It was Tosillo's Pizza, and my mom worked there, and my aunt worked there, and my uncles worked there, and they made pizza, and, and they had the best time there, too. Wow. So, yeah. in your town, your Italian family was very close knit. You had your cousins near you, yes. and yes, yeah. Where I lived on to the left of me was my grandmother, to the right of me was my aunt and uncle, who were my godparents and my cousins. Behind them was my great grandfather, across the street was my grandmother's house. Fantastic, and everybody got along. There were no vendettas and feuds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there were those moments, you know. We we all we called it the island. If you weren't talking to somebody, they're on the island. And one time, my cousin Ralph, who was my dad's generation, said, where is this island you're talking about? It was like our code. Yeah. That's where we yeah. put people were not talking to them. He said, oh, all right. There I've was all the island. And then the other grandfather and grandmother behind them lived the street. Behind them was another aunt and uncle. Beside them was another aunt and uncle. That was the other side of the family. But they all lived close knit, too. So. I bet they got, they got along because... They were working for somebody who wasn't in the family, the department store crew. Yeah, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Nobody was the boss, put it that way. And in your family, did people work a lot of different jobs to make extra yeah. money? Uh, eventually, yes, yes. But the jobs they had, it seemed like they had them a lifetime. Wow. So they had, they had, they had a central job. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How important was college and education in your family to the new generation? For me to go to college was a big deal. I went to Fairmont State College and um, my brother went to college. And my, my generation, my cousins are the first ones to go to college out of our families. My parents didn't, my grandparents didn't. Now, did everybody um, go to the graduations? It was a big oh, deal. Yeah. It was a thing of honor, right? Oh yeah, then there was a party afterwards. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, it's one of my favorite things about being Italian is that reverence for education, that um, the idea that that you're smart, you can do it. And the, 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 and the other thing is this, the work ethic. The work right. ethic will never right. leave us, ladies. It will never leave us. It is, it's, it's in you. And it's so clear to me as I read these books, how much you put into it. Because writing, as much as it's an art, and it is an art, it's also, you have to be dogged about it and you have to go over it and over it and change it and change it. And in your family, Barbara, was education an important thing? Absolutely. 
my father had a limited education. They didn't have the opportunity in Sicily. It was as simple as that. My mother married out of high school to my father. So all three of us, uh, my brother has two associate's degrees. My daughter, my sister has a master's. I have a bachelor's degree and um, we've made good on his wishes and it's very important. And all of our kids are in college now and, and it, yes, and there's a party for everything. So when we graduated, it was celebration time. Parties are, you know, for me, they're some of my happiest memories. Absolutely. The big tradition, everybody loved to come to the Barcelona parties, please. Homemade vino, homemade food, tons of food, nuts, amaretto, frangelico, all the good now, stuff. Now, when you were, um, do, do you both have this memory of the, of the nut bowls at the end coming out? That's when the real talking would begin. Oh, boy. And, and the hard candy, the little summer, hard candy. The little hard candies, but you needed the nuts to get you through the four more hours that you were tacking on at the end of dinner because you get the weak trembles. You feel like, hey, did we eat enough? You know, of course we did, but 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 then you hours pass when you're talking. Some of the great memories are of those things. Absolutely. So for you, um, who brought the beauty into the home, your mother or your father? For Diana? I'd say both. And who for you and your family, Diana, who brought the faith? The Me, women um, or the um, men? More my dad. Interesting. More my dad. Like we did Usually not miss Sunday mass ever. Really interesting. Yeah. He was an altar server growing up and mm -hmm. You know, we, we never missed mass. And my mom was the one who, with the other ladies, cleaned the church every every Saturday, getting ready for Sunday and did the linens and cleaned the um, vestments that the priests wore. Now, did, like, you, did you have, you the, the bishop, as I remember, when we moved to Big Stone Gap, was out of Wheeling, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. So what was the order of priests where you were? Bishop is still in Wheeling, West Virginia. So were they diocesan priests? Because they, they were diocesan priests. Yes, okay. diocesan priests. And you'll notice in, in some of my stories, uh, they're dedicated to some of the priests that um, I grew up with that I had. And matter of fact, in this one where there's a wedding, the priest that married my husband and I, his name was Father Charles Carroll, and he loved the Boston Red Sox. And so this book is dedicated to him. And on the page where Father Charlie is standing at the door for the wedding, yeah, you probably can't see it there, but I had Ashley put on a little pair of red socks. That's fine. Anyway, he's, he's got little painted red socks on, and that's just a little thing the that Cincinnati I know, red. I so, know that he's there. So, so did, did the priest come to dinner? Did you have that situation? Oh, yeah. Growing up, oh yeah, it was it was a big thing of honor, right? They still do. That's nice. That's nice, and there's still diocesan priests from mm -hmm. West Virginia. Yes, because we had the Glen Marys. Did you know the Glen Marys? Mm -mm. Interesting, because they they're the phenomenal, um, and they they go to the poorest places. Um, this last one is again dedicated to two of the priests, Father. And what are their names? Their names are Father Benny and Father Chris Turner, and the characters in the book names are Benny and Turner. Oh, I would go to mass and they'd say every Sunday, everybody's in your books but us. Everybody's in your books but us. I'm like, okay, I'll fix your boat. So they're both in here. And unfortunately, Father Benny passed away before it was uh, in hand, but he knew it was what was happening. It, it, in West Virginia, and we'll get to you on this one too, Barbara, but in West Virginia, it was not a mainstream first of all to be italian was already you were an outcast and the second thing is you're catholic and that makes you a double outcast true because the catholic communities are very small in the hills we can attest to that we lived it so what do you think do you think because because you were in a sense a misfit that it made you cling to your faith more 
it was, in Alabama, it was more important yeah, in Alabama for sure. I'm gonna, yeah, for sure in Alabama. Yeah. Uh, we'll, yeah. Barbara, we're gonna have you just tell us your. But Diana, do you think it? This is, do you feel it made you a strong? Made your face stronger? Oh yeah, I think it was. It was the most important thing. But when I read your books, I'm just saying this to both of you. When I read your books, there's also a sense of the reverence of your Italian heritage that really comes through for, I believe, the same reason. So Barbara, can you speak to that? Absolutely. Faith was the center of the household. Uh, we received all the sacraments and there was a party for everything for that too. And uh, yeah, there was always a party. My uh, mom was in charge of making sure we had all the sacraments, but my dad worked very hard to put us in Catholic school in California. And luckily in California, where I grew up, there's a Catholic school every half an hour. So lots of Catholics on the, you know, in California and on the central coast and our um, priests and nuns, we were lucky to have a school full of nuns. Everybody was what, Irish. What order, were, what order were they, Barb? What, what order were those nuns? Do you remember? Uh, what order? They're all from Ireland. Um, the priest was from Ireland. All the nuns were from Ireland. They came from similar backgrounds, like they all knew neighboring towns in Ireland. And uh, we had very few lay teachers back then. And, you know, nuns get such a bad rap, but the nuns that I grew up with taught me tolerance and appreciation of other people's values upbringing differences i love those irish nuns love them i can't remember what they're well in northern virginia the hospital where uh it was run by nuns called the poor servants of god and they had the brogue and everything they were right from ireland nobody wanted them and then they founded this hospital that everybody went to wow so interesting yeah it was beautiful it was a great upbringing and um the you know we we had all of our sacraments. Kyle and I got married, even though we were in Alabama and he was still active duty military. We flew back home to California to get married in St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Arroyo Grande, where I grew up and received my sacraments. And uh, we got married at that Catholic church and um, my brother got married there. And there's just a lot of happy memories, um, the Catholic church. And so, that's why it was so strange when I got to Alabama. <laughs> so interesting for, for both of you as authors, it, there really is a fusion of the determination of your Italian roots and that, that work ethic and that pride and your faith. They kind of are married, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Agree. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really Without awesome. faith, I couldn't do anything. It was just too, everything's just too hard. I always say, I mean, every, I, right, everybody has the right to their own beliefs or non-beliefs or whatever. But for me, if I didn't have my faith to lean back on, I, I don't know what I would do. I, I always, and I take comfort in that through hard times. I know I have my faith to fall back on. I'm not alone. I'm, I, I've, I've got somebody uh, on my shoulder, you know, looking out for me, got my back at all times. What bothers you, Barbara, about the way Italians are portrayed in American culture? Well, especially being Sicilian, not everybody is mafioso. <laughs> right. Then, of course, my father started his own cement um, business in Cleveland. And <laughs> so that that didn't help. Um, so those stereotypes that, you know, uh, super aggressive, super mafioso, um, you know, we talked about the Guidos uh, with Tony Listella, you know, that Guido mentality and, you know, um, so that, you know, that was hard to overcome. We did not uh, learn Italian in the household. Uh, you know, we were being pushed to, you know, focus on English and all of us in the family have regrets over that. My sister knows the most Italian um, I speak some Spanish because we grew up in California, but that those, you know, there's no stereotypes about Italians in Alabama because there are no Italians. So I don't have to deal with that here. <laughs> you feel, I don't know. Adriana, Adriana, let yes, me jump, jump in. I think we're reaching the top of the hour right oh, now. Oh, I'm so sad. 
before before we we jump, give us your elevator pitch and show us your children's book because I don't want to leave this episode with everybody who's been watching and loves your writing and you have this new ch children's book coming out December 28th. Okay. And tell a, us. Tell well, us well, what I want to say is it's so up. interesting to me because I'm in the exact same garden as my new best friends here. And so basically um, in, in, in my experience, it takes a long time when you write a children's book and then there's so much for me, it's almost as hard, I, I don't even, or harder because you have a limited amount of time to tell the story, which is why I'm so marveling at the craft, the, the craftswomen that these ladies are. They are craftsmen, they're artisans. Um, my book is about uh, a family in Appalachia, an Italian family called the Amores. Um, and it's Valentine's Day. And the mother uh, is making, is, is gonna festoon the house, which is what my mother used to do. So it's the story of, of the family in this old drafty house and the kids are gone. There's seven kids in the family and a dog named Phyllis. And, um, and so the little girl, the baby of the family is with her mother and she's helping prepare for the holiday. So it's, uh, it's all the grace notes of the Italian experience, which is your mother making it magical, the children longing for the other, for everybody to come home, worried always because they don't have enough. Is the car going to break down? Are they going to get over the mountain? Is there going to be a blizzard? So it's a Valentine's Day story. Um, as someone pointed out, that um, it's about how much you love your family. It's not about romance. It's about your family and the celebration and the coming together. And the themes are familiar. And um, uh, and Amy June Bates did the illustration. Love, I love our illustrators, all of them. I love them. Amy June Bates, she's, a, she's an award winner. There it is. And I just felt she captured the Italian family really beautifully. And, and um, uh, she is a mother of several children. So I think she understood the big family, but she, you know, I was telling the ladies earlier, here's when they all come home and they're hanging up their coats and everything. And one of the things that I, I loved about this process was she didn't know us. And yet she got us. And my mother would do things like make a gumdrop tree. And my mother invented things from nothing, which is what I love about all of our books. There isn't a lot of material stuff, but you don't need it because you have something else that's more important. And it's your heritage. In our situations, it's your faith. And in our situations, it's your work ethic. So that's all here. That's, you know, that's before you, you, know, that's, before that's you can celebrate, you gotta, you gotta do the work. There's, uh, there's something magical about a children's book. Um, I mean, we all grew up with some of our favorite children's books. And um, especially when you're reading it, so you're reading the author, but there's an illustrator behind it behind it even looking at the pictures right in front of you but it's a teamwork between the writer and the illustrator to get it right together to fit together as a team and it's easy to forget about that because you're just caught in the in the in the story of the children's book and you forget these illustrations were drawn by an artist to depict and hopefully in the way the author wants, their words and their stories. And it sounds like all three of you found the right illustrator for you that depicts your words in the way that makes your words come to the forefront and allows the pictures to then tell the rest of the story. I think that's beautiful. And I wanna thank you, Diana, Barbara, Adriana as always, you're a wonderful guest host. You make people. I, I so love cool. these ladies. Please and support you, them. Buy their books. You champion you. authors, which is unbelievable. And as you, you were talking about earlier, the three of you, how important education has been to Italians, Italian immigrants, their their generations that followed. 
every Italian American generation that followed. It was education that lifted them up. And we're going to continue that. We're going to continue that as the order of sons and daughters of Italy and America. And Justin, if you could tell people, do you like that segue? If you could tell people how you can join the order of sons and daughters of Italy and America or contribute to any one of our programs, especially our, our scholarship program where we award scholarships every May at our Nila Gala. Uh, please, uh, please share that, Justin, and, and tell people how they can follow us and, and become members and become a part of things. Absolutely. Thanks, Miles. So if you head over to our website, www.osia.org, um, you can click on the membership tag tab and uh, find your nearest local lodge or sign up directly online as an at-large member. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email us at nationaloffice at osia.org. And like Miles said, um, our foundation puts on um, a, a NALA gala every May. Leading up to that, we do give out uh, 10 to 15 scholarships for Italian and Italian-American um, students here in the United States going to um, uh, American institutions, then also in Rome. Um, so go and check that out. Um, it's www.osia.org and hit the SIF Sons of Italy Foundation tab. Um, also, please follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Fabulous. All right. Well, and follow these again. ladies too. Follow all of us, right, Miles? Thank you so much. Um, it's been wonderful. Next week, we have the fabulous Clarissa Burke, actress Clarissa Burke, who will be on, and she's going to share a book that she's coming out with. Uh, so look forward to that. Next Wednesday will be our final episode of the season. So please tune in, 7 o'clock next Wednesday, and we'll see you then.